All right. So today we're going to look at three images. Our theme today is based on um, jumping up and, and being in the sky. Um, and I just chose that as a kind of, since this was the end of the year and also possibly the last star Friday, um, for a while anyway, I thought it'd be nice to kind of have something a little uplifting to end the year and, and also uplifting as far as the value of Slow Art Friday has been for the past year. You know, Slow Art Friday with the Astro Art Museum was started in response to museum being closed during COVID. It was a way for us to continue to share art and a way for you all to continue to look at art. And it was just a way for all of us to come together and look at some artworks and kind of discuss what we see. So for those of you that may not have attended Slow Art Friday before, how it works is I will put an image up on the screen. I'll give you a few moments to look at it. Then I'll ask some questions and we'll talk about it. Do not feel like you have to um, come up with some sort of deep introspective comments. If the image looks like a school bus sitting on the side of the road, feel free to say it looks like a school bus sitting on the side of the road. Don't feel like you have to find some deep meaning. We will likely find some more meaning as we get into the discussion, but don't feel like your comments necessarily have to reflect that. So with that said, here is our first image. I'm going to ask you to take a few moments to look at it, and then we will talk about it. All right, folks, what do you think is going on in this artwork? Well, I think the artist is trying to say, um, repent, the time is coming. The, the words there obviously are prepare to meet thy God. And uh, above the boy's head where the angel is, um, if you zoom in, it says he is risen over there. And I'm fascinated by the black and white, yet you feel the sun, the, the, the beams, the warmth, uh, you, you feel that something's going to happen. So that's, that's how I feel anyway. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I agree with you on the, the, uh, the sort of religious aspects of the photo at all, but you, I thought that was interesting that you uh, see some, um, some excitement or, or some tension that, that, that something's about to happen. What, what do you see that kind of makes you say that? I think it's the position of the figures um, there, the, the, the way they're moving, bowing, the way the, the, the light is coming down at them. And the boy, his head is up. He looks fascinated, like frozen in time. Like he can't believe what he's seeing. I mean, his hand is at his side and his head is up. And uh, he, he just like, is there something's coming out of the sky? The way he's looking straight up and also on the, uh, the billboard or side of the bus, whatever that is, um, there is sort of that big light, sort of, sort of a, a rapture type occurrence going on, wouldn't you say? So what else can we see? The shadows, the shadows are very interesting to me. So tell me what you, um, what, what do you find interesting there? The, the angles and the way the, um, the figures are elongated or um, depicted, it, it makes it look as if there's more people there than there really are. Um, so. Yeah, I almost think that the photographer is taking a jab at the propaganda of the piece, you know, and um, the angle that it's shot at, like, he's not showcasing the artwork, which looks like it's on a fan. It's probably some kind of recital or um, traveling missionary group that this young boy's witnessing the artwork on the side, which, you know, the nudity, I think, just is uh, really interesting on it. And their use of disguising or like how they use that one beam to so that guy's not completely nude 
<laughs> you know, but he's got no clothes on. Um, and then the way that the position is like, prepare to meet thy God, but then if you notice those two arrows at the bottom and how they're now extending out off it, it's like, so that you've got this idea that God is this bright thing, but the script says, prepare to meet thy God, and the arrows are outside the picture. So it's almost like it's he's not here, <laughs> you know? And I think that's what the photographers say, like, God is not part of this painting. This is, um, it looks to me like a revival. It looks like hellfire damnation type of rather than the glorification of God. Um, we do have the temple. We do have the angel back there with something in the bubble. But um, I think with that angle, especially that kind of 45 degree angle, the photographers asked you to kind of look at it from a from a different angle, not straight on. And I think that's an important cropping that he's chose to do. So some 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 interesting viewpoints that I want to make sure I heard you correctly. In the your very first sentence, that you said you thought the photographer was taking a jab. Is that right? Kind of like I I don't think the photographer is really kind of buying into this idea huh. that's on the fan. You know, um, and the way that they've cropped it, they're saying, especially with the way that the topography leads into those two arrows and that those arrows are extending outside. Um, and it's also that image there is outside the church uh, with people outside. And so it's kind of like God is in your community more than it is this bright thing at the top of these steps, you know, that's blinding people, you know. <laughs> And I think those are all excellent observations. I really like your <laughs> observation that the the beams of light are also serving as kind of fig leaves on the on the nude figures. Yeah, that's um, a good description. Thank you. That was what I was looking for. Which I find that I, I yeah. So and also if I if I if I understand where you were going, also um, even though it says prepare to meet thy God. If we look at the image, and if someone said, "Do you take a photo of something godly?" This might not be the image you would take. And no, I, I think of in days gone past, this kind of idea of religion and prophesizing like this, and having missionaries going from town to town. Um, there was a real kind of curbside appeal to this at a certain point, but I think modern religions are kind of moving away from this idea of um, segregation that only a few people are going to have any um, that only a few people can have spirituality in that sense. I guess today we've got a lot, a lot more spirituality happening rather than religion if, that's, if that makes sense. So, so uh, very interesting. I, I like your reading this and then Annette B in the chat says um, the boy's left hand and arm aren't visible, but it's interesting that the odd white shape, almost cat-like, might imply that the boy has the power or is part of the image himself. And um, I'm going to go over here with the cursor. And is this the shape that you're referring to? This, I think Laurel kind of called that an angel shape early uh -huh. on. But... It looks like an angel. And you have the temple where, you know, Christ was supposed to have risen from after the third day. So the painting itself, I think, is pretty awesome. Like, those figures are really kind of cool. You know, they're almost alien-like, but... Um, Interesting, because I, I also thought that they had a very alien look to them. Yeah. I kind of, you know, like, the point is, like, oh, you don't want to be that person. But I'm like, but they look cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the image kind of has more of a war to war of the worlds look than a meet thy god look <laughs> yeah and it does look like it's all men like where are the women in this in this picture um all right that's a good a good question so let's see if we can zoom in on the angel or the figure mm -hmm. um, yeah it's it does kind of have an angel. You can see two hands and possibly wings. Yeah. yeah. 
in the uh, the positions of the different human figures. I um, mean, they you know they got the one that I don't know that's kind of above the the T and the two is crouched down. I don't know if he's crouched or has been smitten down or what. But uh, the, but the shadows on those figures are really um, appealing. Like they they're so descriptive. And I think it was like um, you had said earlier, it makes it look more crowded with the shadows. There's more people there. So, I agree. I agree. So, and one thing I found kind of interesting is in the in the wording where it says "prepare to meet thy God," it's in quotation marks. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if that's because it's a direct quote or if that's kind of like a scare quote kind of effort. Mm -hmm. But I also admire the fact they put a period on there. So they got their, uh, it's grammatically correct. Yeah. Any other comments or, or questions before we um, take a look at the actual artist and talk about him for a moment? There, I, I do find it interesting that the shadow on the tax is the opposite direction than the rest of the shadow. You see, like the like the light source on that, prepare to meet thy God is coming this way, where everything else is coming that way. Like the shadow on the type doesn't follow the same. So say that uh, again. Which shadow? I'm not. I didn't follow that. So where, where it says, prepare to meet thy God, uh -huh. that 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 shadow is on the left hand side. So it means that the light source would be the right-hand side for that shadow for the type. But everything else is the light source is coming from, like we've got the shadow of those people all coming to the right side rather than the left side. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that is kind of, kind of bizarre. Yeah, like that's something in Photoshop and graphic design. You're like, did you get the shadow right? <laughs> you know, so that's something <laughs> as a graphic designer, you just kind of notice because you're like, oh, we've got two different light sources. Yeah, well, I, I suspect. I, you... Go ahead. I do like the, the, the typeface. The typeface is really strong. It, 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 it is very, um, very direct. You're exactly right. So. Let's look at this. So this is actually called Tent Revival Number One, and um, I think I think Gary it was you that made a reference to a revival earlier in mm -hmm. the in the conversation. You were right. Um, the, the photographer is Ralph Burns, and this is um, was taken in 1992 and printed in 2018. It's a fiber-based wow. silver gelatin print on paper. Anybody have any thoughts of where this revival might have taken place? Well, it actually is local. It, we photographed this in Naples. And for those of you that may not be too familiar with this area, Naples is um, kind of on the Henderson County, Buncombe County line in the Fletcher area. And I actually think maybe a Venice Hospital is, is technically in Naples. It's not incorporated. So I think all anybody that lives in Naples would have a Fletcher address, I think. Um, but this was actually taken in Naples. And um, the photographer Ralph is a native of Louisiana, but he actually moved to Asheville in 1975. And um, he is a long recognized as a documentary photographer. His images have captured diverse and the enigma enigmatic nature of ritual and religion. So there you go. And he's explored the subjective and often defining nature of belief, worship, and culture. And he uses his camera to probe a constantly shifting human landscape and to document public and private aspects of culture and religion and transition. And I think there again, I think you mentioned that, Gary, that from what these images um, show to religion today, ha there have been some transitions. So I think you hit that right on the mark as far as what, what Ralph Burns was, was going for. Anything else before we move to the next image? It definitely looks like a much older photograph, like 1992. It, 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 like it, I, 
he definitely captures a, it seems almost like a different time period. Like the little boy's clothes even look uh, a little older in style. You know, it's like I, I would have dated that a much earlier photograph. Well, you know, and, and I'm going to guess that at a revival in Naples, you might not have people wearing the latest fashions. Mm -hmm. and so that could be it. It could be that the clothes do look dated, but it may just be that he's wearing hand-me-downs kind of thing. That would make sense. It's a great image. The printed oh, date. Yeah, the printed date. Look at the difference. 1992, but printed in 2018. Well, you know, in, and that could be for a number of reasons. Um, you know, with a photograph, because the ability to print does not mean that the Asheville Art Museum has the only copy of this photograph. So when he took the photo in 1992, he may have made prints that were, you know, um, that are hanging in other museums or private collections or on his living room wall. Um, but then perhaps you see that this was a gift of the artist. So maybe in 2018, I think there was a Ralph Byrne show at the art museum. And so this likely was printed for that show and then given to the museum. All right, here's our next one. So take a few moments and let's look at this one. So, okay, what do you think is going on in this artwork? It looks like a shot of the sky somehow, clouds and blue, and it looks like things are either exploding or floating. Um, it's hard to make out what all these little pieces or where they came from or why they're there exactly. So I, I think what, I, heard, what, what I, I heard is you see a lot of, I'm gonna call it debris floating around in this sort of sky view, but there's not enough information to, for you to figure out exactly what, what those are or why they're there. Exactly. I, I mean, it looks as though, especially the big one at the top is a cloud, and but yet the, the burned top of it, and um, it looks like it's in the sky. Yeah. So it's, um, it's hard to say exactly, did these pieces come from off of there or some other explosion in the sky or, um, yeah, it's interesting, but uh, I can't, make a definitive reasoning is to pin what the pieces represent per se. So, and I think that you kind of, at least you're taking me down sort of an interesting um, thought process around this in that at first glance, it looks very tranquil, just big fluffy clouds floating through the sky. But then as we start to look at it, you see that what you described as a bird looking area up in that top right, part of that big cloud and then possibly these there's some flots of jetsam from like an explosion or a fire or some kind of turmoil that's going on in that cloud so what else can we see well, also what we don't see there's no, the other picture had people, obviously, and there's no, um, no people, no birds, no animals. Um, it's, it's what it is. So, uh, some more good thoughts in that it's, it's, there's nothing else going on other than clouds floating to the sky. There's no birds, no no airplanes, nothing. So what do you make of that? Well, you, you wonder if it's a, a, a digitally, because to me it looks maybe like three or four photographs 
on top of each other, maybe like that one pointy kind of cloud that comes in seems that maybe it was superimposed on there. Are, are you looking at this one? Um, the, uh, up further. Oh, this one up here. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then you're not really sure what the material might be. Like some of it looks like it could be a watercolor. Some of it looks like um, kind of dodging and burning in Photoshop. And um, but it, it, you know, it seems to have the three coordinates. You know, the top part seems a little different than the the cloud mass, and then the lower part has the debris. I like that description of the debris. Um, and then that part at the bottom could remind you of a Petri dish or something like that. Um, which is probably not, but if, <laughs> if it was just the bottom part, it would look like a Petri dish, you know, or just some watercolors that they have kind of been playing with. Or It's, in, it's, it's interesting, but I'm, I'm kind of in agreement that I'm not really sure what it's doing or why it's doing it. It's just kind of there, you know. Plus, it's kind of blurry, especially the bottom part where Gary's talking about the Petri dish. It, it doesn't, it's not in focus. I mean, I'm assuming that's purposeful. So it kind of almost gives you a little bit of a dreamy, like, quality, mm -hmm. kind of fuzzy there. So, um, so several interesting things I heard here is one is that the... Um, it almost looks like it's layered. Like you said, there's images superimposed on images to create these mm -hmm. layers of clouds. But at the same time, the lower half, like you said, looks more like a Petri dish. And if we were to, um, say, <coughs> take out the big cloud, it doesn't look very much like a Petri dish, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, it could be that those little green spots are little islands. Uh, you're actually seeing it from kind of up looking down through the clouds to the kind of ocean below. Uh huh. So, like if, you were, like if you're in Google Earth and you kind of a tilted it and you're out in the South Pacific somewhere, <laughs> you know, where there's just a few little islands here and there. But, um, and then, the point of view, or if, if you're jumping out of a plane with a parachute on your back, that's kind of the view you would have. Well, you know, if, you, if you imagine that. And, um, and that's very true. And that kind of fits with, um, with what Laurel said, that it's all sort of a soft focus, blurry lines kind of view. So if we kind of put all that together, um, sort of the view of, jumping out of an airplane, the soft focus, the blurriness, um, the fact that you, at one point you said it looked like you could be looking down into the ocean. So I think part of this is just about maybe the vastness and openness and then, um, I don't know if this is a real word, but the infinitiness of, of the sky. Mm -hmm. and, and then Annette in the chat has noticed several dynamic arrowhead shapes. And then let's kind of zoom back in and see if we can see what she's referring to. So there are there are several, you know, that sort of come to a point. That one looks like a fish to me, that dark purple one. Um, let's see. So I, I will say, I think it's very organic. If we look at these shapes, you know, say if we look to the right, these almost look um, amoebic to me, like we could be looking at amoeba swimming in a solution under the microscope. Mm -hmm. If I had to put music to this, I would put Lucy in the sky with diamonds, you know. Almost <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you know? So very good. So anybody else? So I will tell you that this image is very, very large. When we get to the, well, let's go ahead and go to the title slide. Um, and I forget the dimensions, but it is 68 by 44 um, inches. So it is over five feet high by almost four feet wide. 
So with that scale, does that um, make you think differently? Well, I think it's interesting that it's oil on canvas. That That's very interesting. And um, it is large. Well, um, because so I think someone um, earlier, I think Gary might have said, or maybe you did, Laurel, that it, it does have a watercolor look to it. But yet, if we look at the image, you said it, you were surprised to see it was oil. And I want to tell you that the artist, Jacqueline Herman Gorovich, was at Black Mountain College. As you can see, this is a gift of the artist from the Black Mountain College collection. And um, for those of you not super familiar with Black Mountain College, um, you know, it was a very um, experimental, um, was experimenting in art was a big part of their focus on their, on their art studies. And especially with women artists, they really encouraged women artists to be very experimental. Um, so I think the oil and the why it looks that way is possibly because of the way that Jacqueline Gurvich may have um, experimented with oil paint. For example, um, if you're familiar with um, Helen Frankenthaler, one of the things that she did, and I'm sorry, I can't come up with the name of the process, is she would take um, canvas and would not prime it and would paint with oils heavily diluted with turpentine so that the pigment would soak into the canvas and look more like watercolor. So this artist may have done um, some similar things with that. So any other observations on this one? So the artist, Jacqueline Herman um, Gorovich is, is from New York. She knew she wanted to be a painter from an early age, and she someone suggested that she look at Black Mountain College. And she had been to the South and been to the mountains in, I think, Southwestern Virginia, so that, and liked it, so she decided to try to get into Black Mountain College, which she did. She did not finish. Um, she never got her Bachelor of Fine Arts, but she actually did study because she pretty much convinced them because she was a successful painter. She didn't need a fine arts degree to, to teach painting. And she paints skies and clouds a lot, encompassing, encompassing earth and the city that is now her home, and she now lives in Chicago. Her subjects are often observed from a distance, and I think very much there's a distance aspect to this painting, because as, um, as Gary said, it, it, you, it, in some ways it looks like you can see the ocean, which if you're up in the sky would be a great distance. And she is best known for cloud paintings, and she has written, and this is a direct quote, sky has always been central to my painting. It is inexhaustible. It is always there. Observing the sky inevitably leads to reflection about the fugitive, the recurring, the abiding. My painting has always been often about nature and intensely concerned with its translation into paint. So I think we capture a lot of that in a discussion around, she says, the fugitive, the recurring, the abiding, and the, the sky is, is always there. I think we kind of, a lot of the stuff we, we touched on can have that feeling to it. Okay, any other comments or, or questions before we move on? All right, next on the agenda. So take a few moments to look at this one and then we'll talk about it. All right, what do you think is going on in this artwork? It's an action sports shot. It, it doesn't seem to be posed per se to me. Um, I, I, I like the shadow. I, I really in, am intrigued by that, that full shadow there and the strength that you can see in his left hand and his arm. You know, it's, um, I think it really captures 
the, the, the strength and agility of the athlete. And, and I would agree with you 100% that, that that left arm, especially with that red um, sweatband around it, really brings our attention to it. And the muscles, the way he's got it lit, um, you can very much see the muscles and the strength. His posture, the fact that he's leaping into the air, speaks to that agility that you mentioned. Um, what else can we see? Uh, Hank, I think on the one that we're previewing through Zoom, is getting cropped off quite a lot at the edge. Do you see that? Say that again? The the photograph that's so showing up on Zoom is cropped off a lot at the edge. Like the whole the ball is in, in his hand. Right, the and right he's... edge. Uh-huh. Because of the yeah. shadow, you can see the ball in his hand. Well, I've I've got it up on my screen here from the museum, and you can actually see the ball in his hand. Oh, interesting. Right. And and in that Let's one, um, let me see if I here I'll I'll put the um, JPEG in here for everybody. I put it in the chat, um, and in the full picture, you can kind of see that he's holding the ball, and it looks to me it looks like a. This is like. What is the difference between commercial art and fine art? You know, and to me, this feels like a commercial piece, especially when you see the ball, because it is completely posed. You can see the brand of the ball. You can see the signature that this is promoting. And then everything about his posture and the openness. Um, I think it's a real kind of, it looks like a magazine piece more than um um, but when you see that ball in, in the hand and you see how posed the ball is with the logo saying Wilson and then um, it looks like Er Jordan or something's hand signature on the ball, it makes it very commercial looking for me. I love it as far as the graphicness of it and the positioning, but I, I think it's uh, it's very contrived. Like it's not a it's not a candid shot or a, a, like I don't think there's anybody else on that on that court other than him. Well, and I think you're right. And um, if you all have it clicked on the link that Gary put in the chat, I encourage you to because it's an entirely different photograph. And I thank you for that, Gary, because um, the museum staff puts these slideshows together for us. And when I was reviewing this last night. I thought, why did I pick this picture? It's not that great. But now that I see the unedited, I know why I selected it, because we select these months in advance um, for Slow Art Fridays. And it's a whole different photograph. You're right. And I, I really like the way, now that we can see the full image of the athlete, how the shadow sort of mimics him and sort of doesn't. Yeah, the shape of that shadow is fantastic. You know, it's like you... I, I just that perspective, that aerial perspective, and then to have that whole kind of the length of his body right down to the fingers and how they are spread out. I think that's all really intentional. Um, but I think it's really beautiful looking too. Like, and, and the way that his shadow is not over, overlapping with the basket uh, set up either. Oh, I agree. I agree. And to me, the shadow, you know, the athlete looks very dynamic and he's he's leaping into the air um, based on his posture and where, how his legs are positioned. But I look at the shadow, it almost looks like the reverse, that he's fallen down the way his legs are positioned. Mm -hmm. The shadow of that arm is a long, skinny arm rather than the, the muscular arm that we see on the actual athlete. It's almost like a a compare and contrast kind of situation. Well, if you notice in that shadow, the part that's most in focus are the shoes, which leads me again to make it more of a commercial shot that they're actually showcasing the shoes in that shadow and you're seeing the bottom of the sole in, the, in, in his posture. So again, that's, that's why I kind of feel like it's commercial. If, if his head was as sharp as the shoes were in the shadow, then I wouldn't think that as much. But as you see, the shadow kind of gets softer towards his head. Right. I, I, and um, 
I will tell you that I don't think it was a commercial shot for either the shoes or Wilson basketballs. Okay. But the photographer, Walter Yost, um, was a major photographer for Sports Illustrated. Okay. So he, he, he was, in a way, a commercial photographer. He photographed, I want to say, over 300 Sports Illustrated covers in his career. And he's still alive, but he's now in his 70s. Um, and for, um, I think Barbara just joined us. And Barbara, it, it'll help you look at the image. If you click in the chat box, you'll see that Gary has posted a link to a better image than is on the, um, in the slideshow that I have up here. A couple other things I want to point out is if we look at the lines that are, that are created by the shadows and by the athlete, any thoughts on the lines that are created? So are they horizontal, are they vertical, or are they diagonal? I almost wonder if they have uh, some of the golden ratio where the spiral kind of comes into that shadow. Um, if that would be some of the layout on it. Well, and um, one other thing, I'm going to get going back to the line is to me, there's a, a, a preponderance of diagonal lines in this image. You know, the, the shadow's arm, the actual shadow itself is almost on a diagonal. The, um, the back board to the hoop is on a diagonal. The shadow is very diagonal. And, and that diagonal lines in art often are used by artists um, and photographers to, to give us a sense of movement and motion. And I think that's... that. If everything was sort of tipped to where those same lines were horizontal, I think it would be a much less exciting image. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious as to the location of the photographer. It looks like obviously from above, maybe with a, um, a zoom lens of some sort where they were is able to be further back and up higher and looking down and just have that zoom lens to capture the shot. It's a good, a good thought. I'm going to assume he's somewhere high in a, you know, this is in Lyle, Illinois. I don't know if it's in a stadium or just a, you know, what size arena it's in. Um, but it looks like it could be pretty high up and zoomed in, like you said. Anybody else have any thoughts on this? I do. Yes. First, I apologize for um, coming so late. So whatever I have to say may be totally off target, but um, it just brings to mind my experience with basketball because as a little kid and funny as a, a young girl, I was really into basketball because my dad would take us to basketball games and my brother would come. Of course, he was interested because he was a boy and I was totally into it for some reason. Well, I'm from Boston. I haven't lived here for a long time and I just came back four years ago. And I'm with all of you because I was um, in North Carolina near you for five weeks. So I got familiar with your museum and just fell in love with it. So here I am with you today. And this totally reminds me of my experience as a little kid. And I think it just really captures for me the feeling of basketball. Like what a perfect view, because you just mentioned, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. The woman mentioned the view from up above. It just really captures for me the feeling of basketball. Like this has got to be the perfect view of basketball, even though of course we only saw it head on. Just the acrobatics that they do, look at that. It looks like he's flying in the air. And um, since I'm from Boston, I got to see the best team when I was a little kid, which was the Celtics with um, Johnny Havlicek and Sam Jones and Casey Jones and um, who was and um, the famous oh, I'm 
I'm spacing out on his name, the famous um, talk show host, Johnny Most, not talk show host, but sportscaster. And he's, and I was heard it with my brother when he said, and Havlicek stole the ball. I can still can hear it in my head because we were listening on the radio. So that's my comment. So, and, and I'm going to go back on something you said, Barbara, you mentioned the, the feeling of, of the basketball game. And then as you talk more, I'm going to guess that feeling is excitement. Absolutely. I, I still would. I, I had a friend for a while whose son played a high school basketball. I was totally into it. I would go with them to the games. And that's what, 15 years ago? <laughs> And, and I can't stand bass. I can't stand football. Number one, <laughs> it's, um, known to be the um, time when women are battered the most. Highest well, incidence of domestic violence. And and I um, I think you um, actually when you said you can't stand football, it made me think of if this a similar photograph was taken of a football player or a hockey player um how would that look and would it capture that same sense of, of excitement, that same sense of the, the prowess of this athlete? I don't know. Yeah. They well, were towers. I have, I, I'm sorry to keep interrupting, but I actually lived, grew up near where Larry Bird lived. And I was running at the time in my twenties when he was playing. And I just happened to look over and there were these two giant men who completely filled up the back seat of a big car. Then I realized who it was. It was Larry Bird. That's where he lived because these guys are giants. Yeah, and I even tall. got to meet them when I was a kid because I went to the right camp by chance. Just happened to be the basketball camp of the Boston Celtics at the end of time. I was the, at the end of the camp season. So I happened to meet Sam Jones. Well, <laughs> I got very good. Big hand. So, so it in your case, since you're a big basketball fan, it's something this photograph also is is um, bringing up a lot of memories for you of, of yeah. basketball and your love of basketball. So, so excellent. Any any other comments or thoughts on this one? Well, I I did do a little uh, digging into this one, and um, the photograph, the photographer says the photograph was actually commissioned originally by a German beer company to illustrate tennis players and they came up with the idea of having the tennis player with the shadow. That project didn't go forth. He didn't have the equipment to do it justice. And then shortly after that Sports Illustrated commissioned him to do this picture. And he said, let me use this idea from the beer commercial wow. with, uh, with Jordan. And he asked him for 15 dunks and Jordan says, I'll give you three. <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, so this was already, um, so it, it was coming from a, a commercial ad that the original um, design for it. Um, so this idea of taking it from above with the shadow was conceptualized for a different sport. So that was interesting. You were saying earlier, how would this look as a different sport person? But And it was originally designed for a tennis player rather than a basketball mm -hmm. player. I'm looking at the colors. That, that's very interesting, Gary. I, I find that fascinating. But um, the red, the orange, and the white, you know, are very predominant and stand out. To me, the background, the more we look at it, looks like it's been altered or changed. I don't know that that's a real color, that it may have been um, altered in Photoshop or something else to give that, at least on my screen, it's like a purpley kind of background. The blue or purple, yeah. Um, it's not a natural basketball court color. That's true. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to send you this article, you guys. I'm sorry to bombard you with that, but uh, it's it's a really interesting article. He the photo the photographer actually had the court painted that color. Huh, um, wow! It, it was red before, and for this photograph, so there was a lot of conceptualization to this photograph that happened prior to the shot that I think is really wow. interesting. Um. And that's where I kind of keep, keep keep getting that commercialism to it. But as you said, he's a sports illustrated, so that's kind of his nature. But it really looks patriotic with that red, white, and blue. You know, it uh -huh. like it's, you know, I think that's an important part. And I think that's what Sports Illustrated is really about, is that 
the uh, I can never get that the patriarch the, the, the uh, like they're always an American magazine, you know, in that sense. Well, and and basketball, I think, tends to be an American sport. So I think you're you're right on the mark with the red, white, and blue as being uh, more geared towards patriotism than 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 um, any other aesthetic. Except I think a bas baseball is the most patriotic sport, but I'm not into sports generally. Well, and I would argue that baseball definitely, but. Um, there again, I think if we were using a baseball player, just like tennis players, to uh, to sell beer, um, it wouldn't be the same. So I think that's why we have the basketball. Yeah. You, you know the the first piece of artwork that we looked at that um, the revival. We talked about, yeah, we talked about the elongated shadow uh, of those figures. If we'd used a b baseball player here, because the baseball player doesn't elevate themselves off the ground. So their shadows would have been long like that, whereas the tennis player and the basketball player, they do have to jump. So that right. gives them that kind of, they're not going to create those elongated shadows that you would get if you were standing still on the ground. Huh. But, but you would have had those elongated if we did use the baseball player, like the first piece, which I think those kind of connect nicely. This is true, yeah. All right, let's go ahead and we'll look at the title slide here. So as we said, it's Blue Dunk of Lyle, Illinois. This is Michael Jordan, by the way, in the photograph. Um, and Walter Yost actually um, started photographing at age 17. And I think he had his first Sports Illustrated cover within a year or two of that. He also worked for Atlantic Records for, um, for about four years and did take photographs of like James Brown, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, to name a few. So um, he also, besides the athletes photos, which I think he's the most famous for, he also did a lot of their swimsuit editions. So he's very <laughs> used to working with models, professional athletes, celebrities. Uh -huh. Um, and I've read that one of the reasons that he's been so successful is he doesn't just take their picture, he gets to know them, he talks to them, gets to know them before he photographs so that he in his photographs can try to capture um, some of their personality. Yeah. Wow. So is he African American? No, he is not. Um, he actually is from Texas, grew up in New Jersey. Huh. Um, and like I said, he's, he, I think, photographed for Sports Illustrated for over 50 years and, like I said, over 300 covers. Um, so wow. he's probably the best-known sports photographer in the country. Um, and when the museum this summer had um, three exhibits related to the Olympics, um, he was heavily featured in that show, some of his photographs. Wow. Is, is he still alive? He is. I think he's 74, 75, but he is still alive. And is he still producing art? Um, not that I know of. He's no longer doing Sports Illustrated covers. I know he is kind of, you know, when I was reading up on him, he's moved away from um, the commercial type photographs that we've talked about and has taken some um, I think he did some photo uh, project in Cuba and some places like that. So he moved away from the celebrity model um, athlete world. Hmm. So, all right, I'm going to um, stop right here for a couple things. One, I want to thank everybody for their slow art participation for the year. And while we were going through our um, discussion today, I happened to get an email um, from the uh, learning and engagement staff asking about scheduling Slow Art Fridays through at least the first two or three months of the year. So I know I was happy to hear that. So if you if you are not signed up for the Asheville Art Museum email list, I encourage you to do so so you can get notified when those get scheduled or just check back on the uh, web page and look, click on the calendar and that will list all of the Slower Fridays and a lot of the other good stuff. 
one last thing I want to bring up is I want to introduce you to one of the folks that has been um, a regular participant in our Slow Art Fridays, and that's Lynn. Um, and an interesting fact that I found out about Lynn not too long ago is Lynn is actually a PhD student at King's Business School at King's College in London, and she is working on a research th thesis which aims to explore social interactions that happen during interactive museum programs, such as on-site museum guided tours and online collaborative art programs, kind of like Slow Art Friday. And so if you are interested in, Lynn would like to interview both doses and participants in Slow Art Fridays um, as part of her research for her thesis. So I'm gonna ask Lynn to type her contact information into the yeah. chat. If you are interested in um, chatting with Lynn and, and sharing your your take on Slower Fridays and what you've learned from, I encourage you to um, to send her an email and get in touch with her. Um, I think Laurel, you've already um, talked to Lynn, and I talked to Lynn a, a few weeks ago, and it was great. We had a really good talk about Slower Friday and the experience and, and how it started and and how it's kind of morphed into what it is today. So I encourage you very much to, um, to reach out to Lynn. And I see she just put her content information out there. So like I said, if you'd like to talk to Lynn about Slower Fridays or, or, and, or your other interactions with the museum, I'm sure she would love to hear from you. I don't see it and I'd be very interested. I don't see her information. And if you click on the chat, I, I did, and it's not there. I don't see it there either. But I will say I did a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Lynn um, several weeks ago, and it was wonderful. It, it was enriching, and it was a, a wonderful experience. And I would encourage anyone who um, is interested in participating and helping with the research and uh, um, to participate, because it was fascinating. Um. Barbara, if you have a pen handy, since you don't see it, I will read this to you if you're read, whenever you're ready. I let do me know. see it now. Thank you. Okay, good. But good. you're welcome to take my name and give it to her, too, if you like. So I'm sorry. I had trouble hearing when you gave the exact description of it because I have hearing loss. So do you mind repeating exactly what she does? Because uh, you mentioned it in about two sentences, and those are the two sentences I didn't quite get. So um, she is a PhD student working on a research thesis. She's at King's College in London. And her research is around, she, um, her research thesis aims to explore social interaction that happens during interactive museum programs, such as on-site museum guided tours and online collaborative art programs. So Lynn would like to feature your experience of Slow Art Fridays as part of that research. I'd so, love to. So definitely, if you're interested, shoot her an email, let her know, and she will get back with you to set up um, a time or uh, a time in, in um, convenient for you to do like a quick little Zoom session for you. Um, I'll be very honest, we discussed an hour, but we got into such a good discussion, we went an hour and a half. Um, it seemed like it was only five minutes. So, <laughs> how old uh, is she? About how old is she? About? I'm sorry. How how old is she? Is she like in her twenties or thirties or fifties? Uh, I I'm not even going to hazard a guess. She's younger than me. That's all I'm going to say. Which is <laughs> pretty much a lot of people. So. <laughs> <laughs> And what's your position here exactly? You're a docent or a curator? I, I'm a touring docent with the Astral Art Museum. So um, most of what the touring docents do is um, in-person tours at the museum. The majority of our tours are with school-aged children because in North Carolina, the state funds some different programs. Um, and so we do tours that tie into uh, math concepts. We do tours that tie to language concepts, and that and our most common age is around fourth grade, and they are so much fun. And I'll be very honest, I'm not much of a kid person, 
because I'm not allowed, not, not around a lot of kids. So I'm not that comfortable because I'm not used to them. But I have a blast with the kids on the tours because they see things so differently than we do. If we were to show them these same three images, they would have a whole different take, some of them, than what we just talked about over the last hour. But um, we also started during the early days of the pandemic, um, Barbara, doing the Slow Art Fridays when the museum had to close and we couldn't do any on-site programs, just uh, as a way to, to keep folks involved in art, give us all something to do, kind of talk about art, just sit back and enjoy what the museum had to offer. Well, I, can I say something or do you have to close? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I've been going to museums my entire life. Well, I'm exaggerating a little bit. I guess I started in high school. So I used to go quite frequently to, if you've ever heard of it, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And I'd have all my favorite pictures. And um, then I'd go probably the same day. You'd think it would be a lot, but I'd have specific rooms to go to and hang out in. And this one particular room I remember I hung out in for some reason at the MFA, the Museum of Fine Arts. And then it goes on from there. I've been lucky enough to be in a lot of places in my life. So I've gone to museums everywhere. And, well, and so and what I'm getting at is, I, so I, I don't go to the Museum of Fine Arts that much now. And maybe I'm not reading everything on the site, but I kind of doubt it. I am so impressed with what the Asheville Art Museum does. That's why I became a member. And you well, can even do an ad with me. I'd be happy to do an ad. I'm so impressed. Well, and the, I had so much fun with this Slow Art Fridays thing. And I knew I was late and I didn't want to be rude by coming on late, but I didn't well, want to miss it. <laughs> I'm glad. I appreciate that, Barbara. I'm glad, I'm glad that you are enjoying it because I am too. You know, it's been a two-way street for me. I've enjoyed, um, you know, the participants. I, I can um, tell that they are enjoying themselves. And I have, as I've said often on Star Parties, I learn so much from how you all see things. You know, I get set in my ways when I'm looking at art. And then I do a Star Friday. I see these images in a whole new light. So I appreciate that. With that said, we've got just a few minutes over time. So I do want to encourage you all to contact Lynn. And we we'll wish everyone the best of holidays and a very happy new year. And it sounds like hopefully I will see all of you at a star Friday after the first of the year. If I have anything to do with it, you can come. All right. Thanks, everyone. And have I a good weekend, everyone. Bye, bye, Gary. bye, bye, Laura. bye, Barbara. I thought you guys were the curators, not the docents. <laughs> no, no, we're just docents. The cur um, it's rare that the curatorial staff is on um, Slaughter Friday because they are so busy. And, yeah, but they're but the folks so that train good. us, so yeah. You guys, all of you, I've heard a number of you. You're, to me, you're all so good, you could run the museum. Oh, thanks so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and end the session now, Barbara, but... Uh, and thanks so much for your kind words, and I hope to see you on the next Star Friday. I hope to be there. All righty. Goodbye. Have a happy holiday.